Hello to all of my social scientist friends out there, and thank you so much for tuning in to the Moat C Show. My name is Ross, and I'm coming to you live from Moat Marine Laboratory, located all the way down in Sarasota, Florida, on the west coast of Florida. Now, I am so glad that we have so many people tuning in from all around the United States. This is very exciting, and it's a perfect grand finale to the end of our Summer Scientist series. So it's been a wonderful summer. We have met some amazing scientists from Moat Marine Laboratory that have studied everything from plankton to manatees, sharks to ocean technology. And now that we've met some scientists and we've learned how they think and what a day in the life of a Moat Marine Laboratory scientist looks like, the perfect grand finale to our scientist series is to have an amazing guest expert that's going to teach us how to think and write like a scientist. Now, Moat Marine Laboratory was founded all the way back in 1955 with our founding director, Dr. Eugenie Clark. And boy, oh boy, did she have to think outside the box. Not only was she one of the first marine biologists to even think about how sharks think, but she also had to break that glass ceiling, think outside the box because there weren't a lot of women marine biologists. So that is exactly on brand for our program today. So not only are we gonna be learning about science writing, we're gonna learn about creative thinking, creative writing, and why scientists have to be really creative. So before we introduce our amazing guest expert today, this is gonna be an interactive webinar. So get ready because you gotta use your noodle for today's program. So I hope you brought your thinking caps today because I brought mine. And for our first thinking cap quiz question for this webinar, please use the polling feature that will pop up with your Zoom window. Now, for our first question, we are going to ask, now granted, unlike some previous webinars in the past, where there was a right answer and there was a wrong answer, our first question in today's webinar, there's no wrong answer. I would just love to see just a general poll of what is your favorite subject? So way back in the day, way back in school, what were your favorite subjects? Now you do have the option to select more than one. Did you like English? Did you like science? Did you like math? Did you like social studies? Did you like lunch? Oh my goodness, my favorite subject. Or other, maybe PE or music or art. Because as we start seeing where these numbers come in, and a lot of people unfortunately compartmentalize these subjects. Science never touches English. Social studies never touches math. Well, boy, oh boy, we are gonna learn why that is not correct when we get to meet our guest expert. But before we do, we have some amazing marine science current events with our PR manager, Stephanie Kettle. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Kettle and I'm the Public Relations Manager at Mount Marine Laboratory and Aquarium and here's the news that's making waves. Moat is very excited to share updates regarding the new Moat Science Education Aquarium. Last week, Moat leaders and supporters announced the groundbreaking of the new aquarium will take place in September of this year. The Moat Science Education Aquarium will be an iconic four-story aquarium featuring stunning exhibits of marine animals from around the world, innovative and interactive technology to engage visitors, and three state-of-the-art STEM teaching labs that will serve as a space for informal science education for Sarasota and Manatee County school children. Learn more about the Moat Science Education Aquarium at MoatOceansForAll.org. Planning a trip to the beach? Don't forget to check out the Beach Conditions Reporting System available at VisitBeaches.org. This platform reports a vast array of beach conditions every day, twice daily, so you can plan the best trip possible to the beach. You can learn more about crowds, riptides, jellyfish, debris, temperature, and more. The beach conditions reporting system is available at over 30 Gulf Coast beaches and new East Coast beaches are being added as well. We're also looking to improve the beach conditions reporting system. What do you want to know to put for your trip to the beach? Take the survey and help us help you at bit.ly slash moat beach report. And don't forget, it's still sea turtle nesting season. Females are still laying nests on our beach and we're also in the full swing of hatching season. Recently, 10 hatchlings came to Moat's Hatchling Hospital from a pool on Longboat Key. How did they end up there? The baby turtles disoriented, meaning they went the wrong way away from the water and towards danger as they were going towards artificial light. Help hatchlings get to the water by shielding your property lights at night, remaining off the beach at night, filling in your holes and knocking down your sandcastles on the beach and picking up your trash. Help keep the beaches as natural as possible and learn more tips at moat.org slash 2020 nesting. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for that new segment, Stephanie. Now, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our last guest expert for our summer series, Veronica Lipinacci. You are a grant officer here at Moat Marine Laboratory, which means that you get to kind of work with everybody, don't you? So can you tell us a little bit more about what it means, what does your job do, and what does an average day for a grant officer here at Moat Marine Laboratory? Hello, Ross. How are you doing, bud? Nice this to see so you. This is so exciting. Thank you so much for joining us here today, our grand finale. <laughs> ah, well, uh, I will start by saying that my favorite subject uh, to our question was lunch. <laughs> Same. Um, <laughs> definitely lunch. Um, well, hello. My name is Veronica Lupinacci. I am the grant officer for Mo Marine Laboratory. Um, and my background is in writing and education. Uh, so my background is not necessarily in science. My undergraduate degree was in creative writing and anthropology, uh, linguistic and cultural mostly. Um, and my master's degree, I got my master's uh, MFA from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where actually a lot of our moat scientists study because they also have a fantastic marine biology program there. Um, so I came from a background of writing uh, and actually teaching. So in graduate school, I not only studied uh, poetry, but I was also a teacher. Okay, so the pictures we're showing now are actually a little bit of um, my anthropological background. Uh, so when I was studying cultural and linguistic anthropology, um, so those are some temples uh, all over the world, got a Peruvian mummy in there. Um, <laughs> but anyway, moving on. Um, so I was able to uh, get a good background in writing. I'm a published author, a poet. I have a children's book out. Um, and I have been teaching English uh, and creative writing for several years. I that is so amazing. Oh my gosh, what a diverse resume. I also love that you went to college at a place where moat scientists also studied, but talk about cross-pollinating. That's amazing. You were in the humanities building, they were in the marine science building, and then you bridged those gaps. However, I know from an inside source, you, that you had a very unusual career trajectory, that you didn't follow the typical route. And I think that would be a wonderful story in order to share that there's no such thing as one uniform way to get to your end job. Would you mind expanding a little bit more about your really unique and special career and education trajectory? Sure, I would love to. Thank you, Ross. Um, well, first of all, I would like to stress the importance that you can definitely become a successful student and a successful professional, even if you have a non-traditional educational uh, route. So I actually uh, didn't finish high school in the traditional sense. I left high school and started college early. Um, so I was a non-traditional student in that way. I also um, worked while I was going to school, had a long break. Um, so non, uh, definitely a non-traditional educational background. And I came by my, uh, came by my job at Moat in a non-traditional way as well. Um, I had the privilege of working at Moat first um, in an administrative role, uh, which allowed me to actually work uh, for the first two years at Moat with pretty much every department we have. And the really cool thing about that was I got to learn about all our wonderful research projects, all of our scientists and the cool things that they're doing and our education programs. So I got a really good background in all things Moat. Um, and then to, uh, to come into the position I'm currently in as grant writer or grant officer, I was able to take my background and my writing skills and apply that to my passion and knowledge for all things Moat uh, to be able to craft grant proposals to raise money for Moat projects. Amazing. Oh my gosh. So that's a perfect example of there's no such thing as wasted experience. That everything that you have done in your life fine tunes you to where you end up. So that's wonderful that you are a culmination of all of your experiences. <laughs> I love that. Now, speaking of 
what you do here at Moat. Before we dive in, I know that Moat isn't your only job, that you have another really cool creative writing job. So before we dive in and talk a little bit more about your role at Moat, tell us some of the lives you're changing with your job outside of Moat. Yes, thank you. Um, so outside of Moat, I am an adjunct professor in the Department of Language and Literature at State College of Florida, so a local college here. Um, and in that job, I teach writing, uh, written communications. And the most important thing I do in that job is that I spread the message that strong communication skills matter no, absolutely um, in every aspect of life. It does not matter whether you're going to be a writer or not. If you're going to be a scientist, if you're going to, um, if you're going to be a business owner, if you're going to go into the medical field, it does not matter. Strong communication skills, even in your interpersonal life, matter. Amazing. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. That communication builds relationships and everything is just a collection of relationships. Professional, personal, interpersonal. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. That's such a great point. Now, speaking of these developing communication skills, so we are actually going to pivot over to our next quiz question. So that was a wonderful background into who you are and what you do. So now we're going to dive in, into the meat of this presentation. So let's talk a little bit more about the title in the first place, science writing. So quiz question number two, where is science writing even used? Is it used in research grants? Is it used in education programs? Is it used in those big fancy scientific publications? Or do you think it's used in all of those things? So let me know in the, the Zoom poll feature, where do you think science writing is used? Oh man, we have a super smart audience. That's amazing. We must have some English majors in there, some peer editors, some critical thinkers. So absolutely, Veronica, what is the correct answer? The correct answer is all of the above. Beautiful. So let's dive in and take a closer look at that. So although this is an English presentation, let's do a little dissection of this. So can you tell us a little bit more about what creative writing is, what science writing is, how they relate, how are they similar, how do they complement each other? What's the chemistry behind these two different types of writing? <laughs> Certainly, I'd be happy to. Well, first of all, um, when we think of a traditional science writer, uh, we might think of, say, the scientists actually doing the research who are publicating, or excuse me, publishing um, and contributing to publications that are peer reviewed, so scientific journals. Uh, or you might think of, for example, uh, our wonderful content development manager at Moat, Haley Rutger, or say Stephanie Kettle, our PR manager. Um, those are two other people who actually have science backgrounds, um, and I believe Haley has a uh, science writing background. Hmm. They're more a traditional science writing um, contributing. Uh, but science writing in a broader term also contributes to our educational materials and to research grants. Uh, so both scientists and grant writers have to write research grants uh, to raise money for the work that they're doing. Um, so science and writing, there really is no division, especially here at Moat. So for a little science term, that's a pretty good symbiotic relationship between <laughs> science and writing. I love that. Now, as far as creative writing and creative thinking, I know that unfortunately scientists and mathematicians and a lot of those more hardcore laboratory individuals very much compartmentalize who they are and what their job is. So based on the fact that you have been able to essentially interact with every single department here at Moat, that, I mean, you're a hot commodity. You're the fundraiser. Oh my goodness. Everyone wants to hang out with you. So based on your experience, both as an English professor, as well as a grant officer here at Moat, can you tell us why you think it's important that scientists need to know how to communicate in the first place? That why do they need to be able to argue and defend their information? Certainly. Um... Well, I want to start by saying one of Moat's main goals is the uh, is to translate and transfer science uh, to create a more science literate society. So it is important not only to communicate with uh, for scientists to communicate with scientific peers and other professionals in the field, but of course to the scientific uh, or excuse me to the to public at large. Um, 
why do those two relate? My goodness. There's so much, uh, so much that goes into the relationship between the creative aspect uh, of the communication that we do and the science behind it. So for example, what I do as a grant writer is I tell the story behind the science. So bring that back to the translating and transferring. A scientist has to have good communication skills because- Oh, oh okay, perfect. Oh, sorry, go on. No, 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 sorry, you froze on us for a sec, but you're back now, so go ahead. Okay, a scientist has to have good communication skills because the research that they're doing affects, for example, at Moat, the health of our oceans affect all of us. They affect the world and each of our lives. And how we conduct our lives in turn affects the health of the ocean. Now, if the scientists researching these critical issues of ocean health can't communicate what their findings are, then we have no way to apply that knowledge. That is um, such a great answer. I love the fact that science literacy is a topic that A, exists, and B, you're right, we need to dive more and look into this, that science is really complicated. Science is scary. So being able to have approachable, friendly, and at least readable information is a really great way to kind of de-scary the science and provide that universal commonality that you were just mentioning. So because your job is so amazing and because you get to provide that science literacy to the general public who doesn't know marine laboratory stuff, and bring that back to the moat scientists. Can you tell us a little bit more about what an average day looks like for you at moat? And are there any really exciting, awesome examples of science writing that's taken place at moat? Any fun stories, any fun successes? What are some of your job highlights so far? Sure. Um, well, I would say that my job at Moat uh, is, I mean, it's essentially my function is that I'm raising money for the important scientific research and education programs here at Moat. Um, but what I actually do is a lot of that translating, um, which again is the same thing that I do as a writing teacher is translating to students. And in, at Moat as a grant writer, I translate to funders. So I'm translating that science. So typical day for me involves a lot of reading and a lot of writing. Uh, one of my most favorite part of, parts about my job is that although I don't have a background in science, I get to learn as a part of my job all kinds of interesting, groundbreaking science every single day. To be able to do my job, which is telling the story behind the science, I have to know the science pretty well myself. Now, I am not a typical scientist, I am not a trained scientist, but to be able to write like a scientist, I have to have a pretty good grasp on it. So it's super fun. I get to learn about the wildlife and all the research that we're doing here at Moat, in addition to all the wonderful education programs. That is such an amazing answer. It's also really fun to say like when you're translating all of this stuff that essentially you're like trilingual, right? You gotta speak the general public, you gotta speak science, and you gotta speak that middle ground between the two. That's so cool. I love that. Now, believe it or not, Veronica, we're actually almost out of time, which is crazy because there's so much I still want to talk about. So we're going to quickly jump to our last quiz question because I actually see some questions rolling into the chat box. So our last audience polling question, which Veronica kind of touched on. So let's see if you can figure this out. Do you have to be a scientist to be a science writer? True or false? So what does the audience think? So Veronica kind of gave a little hint about this, but do you need to be a scientist in order to be a science writer? Oh, interesting. All right, so we do have a few trues, but the majority of the answers are false. So Veronica, what is the correct answer? The correct answer is false. You do not have to be a scientist to use writing to contribute to science. That's absolutely right. And then the really fun way to kind of expand upon that is the fact that everyone is kind of a scientist, that by making observations, you're a scientist, by asking questions, you're a scientist. So the fact that Veronica is asking questions about the science makes her a science writer on the science, which is so cool. I love that. It's just so meta, right? Now, moving on to our last topic. So before we open it up to the, po the audience questions, I would love to have you dissect that intersectionality Here's our big fancy science words. I got to impress you with my 25 cent words. So can you talk to us about talk to us more about the science communication 
and why thinking outside the box is so important. So you're a creative writer. How does one expand their creative thought into their writing? <laughs> There's a picture of me being very upset with writing errors uh, many years ago. But how does one use that creative writing toolbox, the writer's toolbox? Um, well, one of the most important things I would say is that you really need to consider your audience. Uh, and in thinking outside of the box, when you're communicating, you want your audience, essentially the goal of communication is to get your audience to have the information you're providing them and come away feeling the way you want them to feel, right? That's the goal of any communication. So when you're writing for science or whether you're writing poetry like I do sometimes or anything else, you really have to think about how your audience, where your audience is coming from and how you want them to feel and perceive. You also have to use some of your writer's tools like, um, as far as thinking outside the box, fresh and original language. Hello everyone, Ross Johnston here from Moat Marine Laboratory. Oh, and sorry about that, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Um, fresh original language is more engaging than tired old cliches. So you really want to use details, images, uh, sensory details, things that are engaging to your audience and things that a person can grasp easily that are relatable. Uh, if you use too much specialized jargon or you, um, uh, you know, go too far into one direction, you could lose your audience. So you really want to consider about using your, the tools in your writer's toolbox to appeal to your audience in the best way that you can. Therefore, your communication is most successful. That is a wonderful answer. Oh my goodness. So you got to frame it and kind of reframe it, restructure it to meet your audience where they're at. Got to make sure that your science and your communication skills are approachable because if you don't get it, they're not going to get it. They got to walk away with, away with something. I love that, which is actually a really great pivot to one of the questions that just popped up in our chat box. So we have an audience member that is asking, based on your personal experience, what do you feel like is the best method for translating science, data, findings to the general public? How do you disseminate that information? Um, well, I would say because I'm not a, a, a scientist, I don't have a background in science, I don't have a degree in science, the way I do it as a, as a poet, as a writer, um, is I think very much about the story. Uh, so when I sit down to learn a really new, fun, but very complicated scientific concept, a new research that's happening at Moat, I first have to learn what all of those details are and make sure I have a really good handle on the subject and everything that goes into it. But then when I try to communicate that to the world uh, or to say a, a potential funder and say, hey, would you like to support this really exciting project? I think about it in terms of story. So I think about that in terms of what does it actually mean? What is the impact? Um, what animals are we saving? How will this change our lives? Uh, you know, what do we need to know about nanoplastics? Why are coral reefs important to us here on land and all over, not just, you know, on site? So, um, so I think about the story mostly when I'm attempting to translate that science. That is so amazing. That also provides a really nice narrative, a start, a middle, a climax, a conclusion. That's really cool to think that all of those entry-level English 101 strategies that we learned about still apply to advanced scientific publications. You got to have the hook. You got to have the abstract. I love that. That's a wonderful idea. Now, considering that we have to meet the public where they're at, a really great example of this as far as conservation literacy goes is the Seafood Watch program, for example where it's a really nice pocket guide. So it's essentially a pocket-sized story on sustainable seafood. And it's set up in a really nice narrative as well. It's set up very relatable, very similar to a stoplight, for example. Everyone knows that green means go. Everyone knows that yellow means yield. Everyone knows that red means stop. So for that reason, if it's on the green list, there's a nice narrative of understanding, go ahead, eat that seafood as much as you want. If it's on the red list, you'll want to avoid that. Big red stop sign, absolutely. Now, as far as consider, continuing that narrative, so Veronica mentioned that we offer some amazing education programs and ways for you to engage moat science all the way back home. One of the best ways to do that is by adopting an animal. So believe it or not, here at Moat Marine Laboratory, you can bring the science home with you. Beyond our virtual learning and science and education programs, 
you can actually participate in bringing an adorable stuffed animal home and a letter from the scientist that works with said stuffed animal. So if you're wanting to engage with a manatee scientist, you can bring an adorable little manatee stuffed animal home with you and develop that working relationship with the manatee scientist. You get a letter, you get that pen pal relationship. So it's a really fun way to see how that manatee scientist is engaging and writing to you as an audience member. Now, additionally, before we cl close up, believe it or not, because Veronica, we are like almost out of time, crazy. We have one last promo we want to feature. So although this is the last of our Summer Scientist series, that doesn't mean we're done bringing you amazing free virtual learning content. Next week, we have an amazing program planned with Microsoft. So check out this promo, and then we'll be right back for closing remarks. Hello everyone, Ross Johnston here from Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium in Sarasota, Florida. We are looking forward to seeing you soon for our live event. We'll be diving into our 135,000 gallon shark habitat here at Moat and learning all about these amazing sea creatures. We'll start with a shark feeding and training session and learn what it takes to take care of our ocean ambassadors. Then we'll look at our new technologies that our scientists are using to study sharks out in their marine environment. You can get ready for our adventure by checking out our Flipgrid topics. Then join us on Wednesday, July 29th at 1 o'clock p.m. as we explore our sharks and our aquarium. Well, thank you so much, Ross. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, my goodness. Now, that was a really exciting thing to look forward to next week. And you can bring a lot of the skills Veronica just talked to us about in order to to apply and make the most out of this Microsoft opportunity. So you can now think outside the box or outside the shark tank, right? And it'll be a great way to reframe your scientific thinking. Now, speaking of reframing your scientific thinking, if you still have a million questions for Veronica, for Veronica because goodness knows I do, this was amazing, please join us on our Flipgrid webpage. Flipgrid is an awesome resource where you can leave us a video voicemail question and we will respond with a personalized video answer. So if you want to learn more about how to improve your writing, if you want to learn a little bit more how to be a science writer, how to merge your favorite topic of English with your passion for science, please join us on our Flipgrid, and we will put you in touch with Veronica. Now, Veronica, my thinking cap is at working at about a million watts right now. You have taught me so much. So as far as closing remarks go, do you have any final tips and tricks that you can provide for our audience in order to think more creative, write more creative and just be a creative scientist. Sure, yes. Uh, I have two things I want to share with you guys about uh, Im important writing tools. The first is that you need to be excited about your content. If you are not excited about your content, then that's going to come through in your writing. Um, and then the second is just the old English teacher adage, Revise, revise, revise. I tell my students this. I do this myself professionally every single day. Don't think that you can just throw some ideas on the page and walk away, do a quick spell check, and submit that wherever it's going to go. Whether it is an email uh, to, a, to a coworker, whether it's a paper for school, or a scientific paper that's going to be published in a journal, you need to do so many revisions of that outline and then revise it and then have someone give you feedback. Take some mental time and space away from your writing. Come back to it. You'll see it in a new light. And don't forget to proofread. That is amazing. I love that. So shoot, I can't rely on cliff notes anymore. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Good to know. All right. Well, Veronica, you were absolutely fantastic. I learned so much from you. It's really nice that you are the intersectionality. You are the catalyst between two different areas of thought. And I hope that we inspired, and no, I know for a fact that we inspired our audience. This was amazing. Now, as far as closing remarks go, we'll make sure to revise, 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 always have a peer editor, and we will apply all of this science to hopefully next week's Shark program with Microsoft. Now, thank you again for joining us. For everyone out there who has participated in our summer-long Summer Scientist series, it's so great to see so many returning faces and to have so many new participants. Hopefully, you learned a thing or two and look forward to some more virtual learning programs coming to you from Moat Marine Laboratory, C-Trek TV. Bye, everyone.